Welcome to Debating Russia here on Voice of Russia. I'm your host, Peter Lavelle. Russophobia is real and impacts how many in the world understand geopolitics, culture, and history. So where does Russophobia come from, and is there anything we can do to counteract it? To discuss this, I'm joined by my guest in London, Jonathan Steele. He is a columnist at The Guardian and an author. We also have Anna Mateva. She is a visiting senior research fellow, Department of War Studies, King College, London. And also sitting here with me in Moscow is Mark Sloboda. He is a senior lecturer and researcher at Moscow State University. Jonathan, if I can go to you first, what is Russophobia? Well, actually, I think it's a hangover from Sovietophobia. I think when the Soviet Union mm-hmm. existed, there was uh, massive um, pressure and uh, media coverage of bad things happening in the Soviet Union. And of course, it was considered to be the strategic enemy of NATO and all that kind of thing. I think where there is still some Russophobia, it's just a hangover from that. I think it's probably more actually not so much phobia, which means uh, theoretically, you know, fearing Russians. I think it's just stereotypes and uh, prejudice and uh, incorrect or distorted images. I don't think people are actually afraid of Russians. They may be afraid of Russia as a state because of some of its foreign policy, but not of Russians. Okay, but Anna, there are so many stereotypes about Russians around the world, and extremely negative ones, I would say. I watched the film uh, Armageddon uh, recently, and it's, it's, it's a fantastic film and all that, but the cosmonaut is a drunkard, an idiot, a buffoon. Uh, the Soviet Union contributed a lot to space exploration, but we still get these stereotypes of Russians. Why? When I first came to live in the West, in London, that was about 20 years ago, Russians, Soviet Russians, just started to emerge on the scene. There were two stereotypes about us. One was that we are prepared to do anything what it takes um, to stay in the Western paradise uh, so that we are not uh, <laughs> thrown out in the um, out in the cold. And the second stereotype was Cinderella goes to the market and she will behave like a Dostoevsky Harry. So everybody who read, okay. you know, in Idiot, or other great pieces of Russian literature expected every put it to act as a character from a Dostoevsky novel. So, Anna, I mean, it seems to me that that means that being in the West, in this case, in London, in your case here, with Jonathan, that tells me that Western people don't know anything about Russians if it, you're giving such a vivid stereotype to different stereotypes that are not even real. But that happened about 20 years ago. What happened then was that Russians did not live up to either of these two stereotypes. They were (laughs) things which developed in the process of um, Russia becoming a new state and also with the new cultural attributes. And in that sense, I'm not sure whether I share Jonathan's maxim that Russophobia is a leftover of Sovietophobia. I would say that quite a lot of stereotypes both cultural and political are product of the modern times and perhaps of the um, last 10 years and especially since Vladimir Putin came to power. Okay, I was going to say we'll talk about Putin phobia a little bit later here. Mark, Russophobia goes all the way back to the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, Exactly. I think it it goes further than that. Russophobia is just another variant of Orientalism, as uh, Said defined it. It's relying on one-dimensional characters of Russian cultural reality uh, as one of uh, millennial despotism, contempt for the individual, and so on. We can observe this sheer disconnect between Russian reality and Russian reality as represented in Western texts and media, not just today, not just in the Soviet era, but this goes back to the 1830s. I was reading a text from the Napoleonic era today from 1839 that spoke about a thin veneer of European civilization on Russia that so was barely credible. So what you're, you're saying is that that's the reference point. Jonathan, I mean, Mark's on to something here, is that Russia has been the other for geopolitical reasons for about 200 years. I can really only talk about, you know, what the feeling is in Britain. I think it's every country has its different stereotypes of foreigners. In Britain, I think people actually, if you're talking about phobia, the literal meaning being fear, British people are still more afraid of Germany than they are of Russia. I don't think most British people fear Russia. They have these stereotypes. I mean, now the new stereotype is these oligarchs, the Russians are all terribly rich, they're terribly vulgar, they love bling, they love throwing their money around, as though you know, everybody in Russia is a billionaire. Of course, we know that, uh, well, that sounds, that's only a well, tiny Jonathan, minority. That, that sounds like envy to me. For some people, it may be a combination of envy. But for other people, I think, who have known Russia for a long time, there is something sad about the way uh, the oligarchs behave and the way they get uh, excessive publicity. So there's blame on both sides. But I do think the Russian rich give a very bad image of their country. And it's not 
correct in the sense it's not typical. I think most Russians are extremely cultured, very gentle, kind, hospitable people. They, they don't flaunt wealth. In fact, they're much less materialistic than the average consumer in Britain. Yeah. Uh, but uh, the Russian rich, I'm afraid, uh, are high consumers and, and very like flaunting their wealth. Uh, Anna, if I can change gears a little bit here, let's talk about popular culture, because I still see in films this perception of Russians of being less civilized, heartless, ruthless. You know, we had the Nazis at one time, to, you know, all, you know, if you look at Hollywood, you know, they were always the bad guys. And then for a while, maybe not so much today, but then the Russians were the bad guys. Does Western cultures need a bad guy? I think all cultures need some kind of enemy or enemy image or opponent or something like this. But what distinguishes Russians from other people, and that's about cultural stereotypes, is there are cultural stereotypes about all sorts of other people. Johnson mentioned Germans, Jews, or you know, black people, or all sorts of people from different cultures and races. But the difference that you can actually say this kind of things about negative things about Russian in a polite society. You can express views mm. which would not be possible to express about other people, even if people have this kind of things. If you substitute them, Russian for you know, something else, mm. then it would be horrible. It would be totally politically incorrect. You cannot really get away with it in press or in meetings. But then you need some kind of enemy for films, for popular culture, for books, for entertainment industry generally. But if you can start, I don't know, showing some Islamists and they will be, I don't know, having features of Arab, yeah, Arabs or Pakistani, it's a, it's a, then you can probably have consequences. With Russians, you don't mm -hmm. really face consequences and you can sort of get away with that. Mark, let's go back to 2008. Uh, John McCain, we're all Georgians, remember that? And that, that was a time of extreme Russophobia in the media. I mean, I think it's always there in Western media, but then it was very strong. It was stronger then, of course, because the United States was backing Georgia as a proxy state militarily with the training and the funding. But I think this Russophobia, this particularly virulent demonization of Putin as the archetype of Russia continues. And I think it's a, a symptom of a real othering phenomena that is different than the othering that you might see towards China and India. When Russia doesn't choose the liberal, democratic... The right path. The, the right path. When I mean, it doesn't choose... <laughs> when it was given the opportunity in the 90s to join and follow and, and be the same, they can understand when China doesn't do that because the Chinese look differently. And they can understand when India doesn't do it. But when... Russia is a white face that looks back in the mirror and says, we don't want exactly the same thing and we don't hold exactly the same values you do, and that scares them. The Western perceptions that the Soviet Union lost the Cold War and losers must follow the winners. Jonathan, what do you think about that? Let's go a little bit up closer to the, the present here. Well, I think that's past. I think that was the period of Yeltsin. And in fact, I was going to come in on the Yeltsin issue because we've talked about the Putin right. image, but the Yeltsin image also created a different stereotype. Yeltsin, after all, had a very pro-Western <laughs> policy, but the stereotype he created was this drunkard, uh, this mujik, we all in, in Britain who didn't know Russian suddenly learned this new word mujik, you know, the Russian peasant sort of yep. earthy, speaks the, his mind, this drunk a lot of the time. I mean, a, a total stereotype. And, and that was, uh, it was a rather lovable thing. Here was this sort of cuddly bear, um, and not the cold, yeah, but Jonathan, uh, he was, but he was a follower. He was a follower, wasn't he? He did what he was told. That's yes, that's the, one the, that, that's the point. I mean, so people, you know, create an image which suits the foreign policy. It's the foreign policy creates the image, I think, rather than the other way around. Mark, you want to jump in? Yeah, I, particularly about Yeltsin, I think we see another of this sheer disconnect from the, the reality in Russia and the reality of what the West writes about. Because what we do have these personal images of Yeltsin, we also have the way that the Yeltsin era was portrayed as an era of democracy and freedom in Russia. When we had Yeltsin firing on a freely elected parliament with tanks and then ruling by dictatorial decree in and the country and for several years. And rewriting the constitution. Uh, rewriting the constitution. So so on and so on, launching the war in Chechnya, and he was compared to Lincoln for it. But when Putin, which is, I think, arguably, in actuality, a much more, and not perfect, but a real representation of electoral democracy in Russia, gets demonized. But why is that? It's because that they differ from the Putin rejects uh, the Western global hegemonic order. He seeks an independent foreign policy path for Russia, and that's the price is paid.
You're listening to Debating Russia here on Voice of Russia. I'm Peter Lavelle. And if I can go to you, this is on something I wanted to bring up earlier. The stereotypes of Russians, in in some degree, is is the fault of the Russians themselves, would you say? Or is this an issue of um, poor soft power on the part of Russia? I think it's both. I think uh, Russians, and, and especially officials for Russians, did not really care about um, having mm-hmm. a positive image of of the country and when they tried to do something that came out as very clumsy and actually very much reminded mm-hmm. the, the Soviet propaganda machine or mm-hmm. then um, mm-hmm. Russians became unnecessarily defensive on the issues of um, especially in foreign policy and uh, showing themselves as extremely vulnerable and being unable to take any criticism if we compare this thing to Georgia they did propaganda brilliantly created a very positive image of the country very attractive very accessible. Mm-hmm. So that, that's kind of quite real inaptitude in Russia, how things work in the West and to what the Western audience would be receptive. That's one thing. But I think that there was also activities of Berezovsky, who managed uh-huh. to brilliantly capitalize on the mood, which was sort of already there and managed to connect some loose ends and uh, present behavior, which is just one of the you know, variety of possible behaviors as a very kind of typical and um, providing argument to a certain interpretation of Russia. If I could give that interpretation in one line for our listeners, Putin did it. Go ahead, Mark. You're absolutely right. Um, One of the things that um, this media characterization of Russia is it denies all agency to the Russian people, to the Russian elites, other political figures in the country. Putin is singularly responsible for everything. Everything. (laughs) If anything goes wrong, it's Putin's fault. If anything goes right, well, it happened despite Putin. Or by accident. By accident. Oh, high oil prices. There you go. Uh, absolutely. Uh, of course, the Russian economy has been so terribly mismanaged, even though it has not anything substantial in the terms of debt, while the Western countries almost as a whole are facing uh, simply crippling debt, which is uh, bringing on the austerity uh, and, and so on. But it's not because the Putin administration has handled the economy and the oil wealth it had well. It's simply an accident of fate. You know, Jonathan, I still read, I get tired of it, but I still read a lot of Western media coverage of Russia. And it it just seems to me that there's just this inability to have analysis. It's very presumptive. I'll give me, I'll give you an example. Uh, Vladimir Putin, comma, former KGB agent, comma. We never hear that when George Bush, former CIA director. Why is that? Well, because as uh, we've been saying, Putin is demonized in the West. And uh, so they highlight that element of his background. They forget about the fact that he spent some time in St. Petersburg after the Soviet Union collapsed, working with Mayor Sobchak and all that kind of thing. So uh, it is what very... People f- would, a person that people would call a Democrat. Yes, that's right. And he was, Sobchak was really praised as one of the big leading reformers in, in the West in the early 90s, in ni- 1990s. So, so it is uh, because of foreign policy image. But I think the, the trouble with a lot of other Western coverage of Russia is it's very Moscow-centric. I don't think people travel enough mm. around Russia. They don't talk about the differences of the different regions of Russia. They never talk to uh, Russian Muslims, for example, who are extremely important, except mm-hmm. in the context of Islamophobia, which Anna touched on earlier on. I, I mean, actually, to be honest, Islamophobia is a much more serious issue for all of us around the world, wherever we live, than Russophobia, because uh, that is real prejudice, and it is covering in such an ignorant way and suggesting that any Muslim is, is a threat. Well, Jonathan, I'm, I'm glad you're bringing this up. Anna, if I, if I can go to you, I think that what Jonathan's saying is really spot on here because if the United States and Russia had a better relationship, maybe Boston, the Boston bombing might not have happened because we didn't see a sharing of information because there's the relationship between the two countries is antagonistic Uh, because what I would say, not everyone would agree with me, because of of prejudice against Russia because of its form of democracy, its type of uh, society. So, I mean, Jonathan brings up a good point. I mean, Islamophobia, it's a global issue and if Russia isn't brought on board as an equal partner, we have outcomes like Boston. I would not characterize a relationship as antagonistic. I would characterize it as a relationship with fundamental lack of trust. And Mm, that's a very big political barrier. But I think that this also has a cultural root. It works on every level. Just my own example, I asked an agency to book me a travel and for a colleague on Ira Flot, and the colleague said, oh, I'm not going to fly Ira Flot. I would like to come to my destination alive. <laughs> and I'd like, to, I'd like to point out to our listeners here is that if you look at Ira Flot's international safety record, it's 
It's sterling. Absolutely. I love, I love flying airports. All right, Anna, go keep going. <laughs> yeah, my daughter meets um, Gorbachev um, at a function here in London, and she comes back to the office, and she has these pictures, and she was very excited. And then somebody in her office says, oh, this guy looks dodge, you know, some dodgy Russian. <laughs> if there is a dodgy Russian <laughs> round, it is definitely not Mikhail Gorbachev. You know, and we're talking about intellectual public. So that goes all the way through the yeah, presidency, through the yeah, people who are in decision making. Oh, can we trust these people? Surely there must be something wrong with Even we can't quite point our finger. They might be either corrupt or drunk or not serious or not professional. Or but they, something of course, must be wrong. You know, something, something must be wrong. Must or, be wrong. Or, or, you know, there will be something human rights and how they get their evidence. We have to look for fault until we find it. And of course, if you start um, w- with that what? kind of aspiration in mind, and Russia is a messy country, you will have proof. You know, Mark, I-, I send pictures of central Moscow to my friends back in the U.S. And the number of times, like shopping centers and, you know, new office buildings, and I have seriously gotten responses. That can't be in Moscow. It, it can't be. And Russia doesn't look like that. What I'm, why I'm mentioning is that it was kind of mentioned earlier is that this place is so monolithic and th- there's no nuance when average people, the people on this panel today are experts, but people in the U.S., people in the U.K., they get so little information, nuanced information about Russia. When you're dealing with the people in the U.S., and I don't mean to be critical of the country of my own birth here, but they don't have a very nuanced or, or complex version of the world outside the U.S. to begin with. There is definitely an idea of American exceptionalism and essentially no other country in the world has democracy, no other world country in the world has civilization. Of course, not at the expert level, but at, at, at the layman's level. When I immigrated to Russia, my parents came over for my wedding and they had never left the United States oh in their lives before. And despite our family having some Russian ancestry, they were absolutely in shock at everything in Moscow. Uh, they were looking for red lines. They were looking for bears, bears in the street. They were worried about uh, KGB agents taking them away. Um, and uh, this uh, really goes to the heart of uh, this uh, Russophobia experience, not only at the media and the policy wonk level, but it, it really reaches down deep to the common people. of Okay, of well, Jonathan, you're okay. a journalist, so, I mean, people in your trade uh, haven't done a good job. No, I don't think they have. And as I say, they, they don't travel enough. It's all about Moscow. It's all about sort of high politics, uh, crime, and so on. And they just don't describe what the real depth of Russian life is like. I mean, it's, it's a f- problem all around the world now that, that the foreign news is contracting. There's less and less yeah. foreign news on television, uh, on the newspapers, even in the web. Unless you're a specialist, you go to particular specialist websites you want, but in the sort of general run of things, there's very little. And uh, it's a tragedy because under globalization and easy, free, cheap travel, we should be knowing more about uh, the countries we visit, but we seem to know less. And uh, how can Russia uh, change the perception of it in the world, do you think? I think first... Is there anything, or does 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 Russia really have to care? Go ahead. I think they should do two things. First, they should understand what the stereotypes are and what they derive from. And maybe there are some things which they can acknowledge. That's kind of the fact. Yes, there are uh, rich oligarchs and they make headlines in London and they have litigation cases and they are high profile and they are frankly speaking news because they have style, they have... Beautiful, that- beautiful women. Yes, beautiful women, awesome. yes. But then, secondly, they also should understand that they should fight certain battles and not try to uh, take uh, the West as a kind of uh, different civilization as a whole. I think uh, this idea of Russian exceptionalism should be um, played down or dropped mm-hmm. altogether if it's possible. But I try to really uh, get a, a sense that how to talk to uh, Western media constituency on its own terms, and but also realize that Russians will never be loved. They can be okay. accepted <laughs> more, right, I'm gonna jump. That's but, new, that's, um, that's but that's point. a reality, <laughs> and it's it's easier to accept it rather than uh, all the time say, uh, why, why we're not European, why the West do not see us as such. Well, I don't know why any people should be loved here. Let me jump in here. Uh, welcome to uh, Debating Russia here on Voice of Russia. I'm Peter Lavelle. Uh, Mark, you, wanted, you were shaking your head. Go ahead. I respectfully am going to have to uh, disagree with Ada there. If we take a look at this phenomenon that we're talking about, Russophobia, we are looking at a particularly Russia-West 
complex. The rest of the world does not have the same phobias to the uh, Russia anywhere close to the extent. And we're living in a multipolar world that is slowly emerging. We don't have to cater, speaking of Russia, we don't have to cater everything towards an extremely ethnocentric West anymore. We have good relations with much of the rest of the world. The West is not the international community. It does not speak for it. And uh, to deny the uniqueness of Russia and of, of a wider Eurasian civilization to try to fit into a West that will never accept us simply uh, isn't needed anymore. But I think that's the key point. Russia and Russians want to be accepted in the West as equal, as part of the same civilization. It is existentially important. That's why they care. And secondly, the fact that Putin uh, creates that kind of alternative pool of attraction, that's also a very big irritant, even if it's just a symbolic state. I landed in Colombo in Sri Lanka, and the first thing which I see notices and portraits of Putin and great things which he said about struggle against terrorism. So it is a pool of attraction, and because it is gaining some some kind of momentum, that would add just fuel to the fire. Well, I just wanted to say, I mean, go ahead, (coughs) Anna talks about Russians will never be loved. I don't think any people will ever be loved as long as they're stereotypes. I don't think it matters. I mean, the fact is that people have different compartments. One compartment is Russian literature. There's tremendous admiration from Russian literature. We've talked yeah. about Dostoevsky briefly. There's tremendous admiration for Russian music, Tchaikovsky and Rimsky Korsakov and ballet and so on. There's great respect for Russian mathematics and chess. You know, there's a sense that Russians have a brilliant mathematical brains so that, you know, all that goes into the mix. And when it comes to foreign policy, then on occasion there is an antagonism about the foreign policy. But I think the average person in the street in, in this country, in Britain, where I'm speaking from, has a has a more positive than negative view of, of Russia because of its long European tradition and heritage and so yeah. on. And uh, in the Soviet Union, it was different. Uh, when the Soviet Union existed, I mean, it was different because people in Britain then had, had, had fear pushed down their throats all the time by the media, and there was some basis for that. Now, there's no reason to fear Russia, and I don't think most British people do fear Russia. I disagree. I will have to say uh, I heard in quite uh, public venues things um, about Russians uh, are being said, which is impossible to say about other people because that would be definitely not on. So I do not think that people have a very positive um, view on Russians. I think the immediate reaction is more to uh, look for something negative and then to be pleasantly surprised if negative stereotypes do not apply to a particular person of a queen. And I, I gave a talk in Poland uh, a year and a half ago, and people looked at me as an oddity because I was saying things what I think is basically objectively true about Russia, and the Poles went nuts. I mean, they couldn't believe it. <laughs> I said, you know, it's, it's a problem that NATO conducts illegal wars around the world, and I was almost ushered out of the room. We've talked about Russophobia and its different forms here, but you know what? Russia still counts. And this is, you know, one of the... John Kerry was here, the, the most red-faced diplomat I've seen in years, patting Lavrov on the backs, thanking Vladimir Putin, because the Americans are in a mess in Syria and their Western allies are in a mess in Syria and Russia maybe could help them out. My point is, is that you still have to deal with Russia, even though you may have an antithesis, antithetical point of view to what they're thinking about. Absolutely. Russia is a P5 member of the Security Council. We are the either the first or the second most nuclear armed nation in the world. We have an actually growing economy. Uh, compared to the West, the the really hard fact that I I think much of the Western elites have with Russia is that they need us more than we need them. They need Russia to impose their sense of global order on North Korea, on Iran, on Syria, on these trouble spots. And Russia uniquely has both the ability and the political will to deny that. And Because there's so little economic relations, particularly with the United States and the United Kingdom, they really don't have much leverage left anymore. There's not enough treats that they can hand out. Well, Jonathan, if I can go to you, it kind of goes back to one of my original questions is that, you know, uh, should the Russians really care about their image in the world, considering what Mark just said? 
No, I don't think they should. I quite agree. And that's why I slightly disagreed also with Anna when she said Russians need to be loved. I don't think they need to worry about whether they're loved or not. If they're hated and feared, then it's, uh, it is important. But I don't think they are, as I keep saying. The Russian has its own interests, its own national interests, its independence, and it must take its uh, you know, course in the world as it sees fit. It doesn't have to kowtow to anybody at all. You know, Anna, when I was growing up, I'm an American. I grew up in Colorado and California, and there were a lot of ethnic communities around me. And we had um, stereotypes of um, people around us, humorous stories, uh, humorous imagery. It was very rarely mean-spirited. Uh, do you think that in, in our lifetime, Russia is going to be, Russians will be treated the same way as a certain kind of stereotype, you know, the costume or something like that, that's basically harmless? I don't think so. I think that um, there are too many Russians. Why? Why? And, um, too many Russians. <laughs> <laughs> and there are too many different Russians. <laughs> Everybody says that on vacation these days. Too many Russians around. Me. Yes, yeah. And, uh, and in some ways it is uh, quite uh, odd because in some way you can say that Russians are uh, very much integrated. There are lots of middle class Russians uh, traveling abroad and doing all mm-hmm. sorts of you know, ordinary things. And it's not just you know, like it was 10 years ago. They were I don't know, very rich men and they were drinking it disproportionately. So in that sense, it takes a little bit of sense of, you know, Russians being exotic. But on the other hand, it's, uh, Russians are kind of existentially or in terms of entertainment and image, um, it is a helpful enemy, um, a helpful enemy image mm. to have. And I think unless you replace it with something, and I didn't quite see what it can be if you take, you know, Martians and uh, aliens out, what would be more convenient than Russian? Yeah, I guess the Chinese can't take that one because people are afraid of the Chinese now. Mark, go ahead. I, simply because of the business and economic yeah. opportunities that China presents, China never falls under the same level of scrutiny. No country falls under the same level. Well, Maybe Iran, Iran and does. North Korea. Okay. Oh, Syria. Okay. Uh, other oh, than... But you know, Mark, I mean, you just said it. I mean, I'm flabbergasted. Russia... North Korea and Iran. The and rogue all, states. All in the same category. So very different. I think you make a good point about China. Go ahead, I, I, I think there is Sinophobia. Fear of China is actually stronger than Russophobia because uh, it's, it's, again, the foreign policy thing. I think Russia is no longer seen as expansionist, whereas China is. Of course, it's, uh, it's early stages, as the Americans think and say, uh, and the Pentagon's gearing up slowly to some confrontation with China. So China, I think, is the is the enemy that's coming over the horizon, unfortunately, in terms of media images, whereas Russia, I think, is uh, is, is no longer in that position. I would also Last say word. that um, to what extent all this matters. And I think that Russophobia matters because it creates fundamental distrust, which uh, prevents solving things which can be solved. Uh, like, um, mm-hmm. as we just seen, yeah, cooperation with uh, Boston bombing uh, could have been better, and this strategy could have been avoided, mm-hmm. yes. Now we um, also look at Afghanistan. Uh, that would be a crucial junction. Of course, cooperation between uh, Russia and the West, and especially the United States, is important and will be even more important. Uh, we look at um, other international issues of tensions like North Korea, where you need really partners to pull together because fundamentally okay, they I share lo- the same values. And really, I love ending a program on a positive note. Jonathan, Anna, and Mark here in the studio with me in Moscow. Thank you for joining me here on Debating Russia on Voice of Russia. Stay with the old.